ビデオ Sometime in the late 19th century, in the small town of Spring Lake, Michigan, a young boy named Windsor McKay looked out of the aftermath of one of the many fires that periodically struck the town. Picking up a single nail, he began to etch the scene of the fire in the frost of a window pane. From that point onward, the young McKay became obsessed with drawing. McKay would draw anything and everything he saw, and with a noted level of detail that was impressive for his young age. He even had the ability to draw things from memory, even things he had never drawn before. His father, however, was not impressed by his son's talents, and enrolled McKay into business school. McKay rarely attended classes, preferring to spend his days showing off his talents at the local dime museum by drawing portraits for a quarter a pop. Between 1889 and 1902, McKay kept doing dime museum work while also doing other odd illustration jobs, from posters to advertisements to editorial cartoons in the local newspaper, all while continuing to improve his art. By 1903, he had moved to New York City with his wife to do illustrations and cartoons for the New York Herald. There, he worked alongside comic strip pioneer Richard F. Alcott, but Alcott would soon leave thanks to the enmity between him and McKay. From there, McKay would do a series of popular comic strips for the Herald. Examples included Little Sammy Sneeze, a strip about a young boy with destructive sneezes, and Dream of the Rare Bit Fiend, McKay's longest running strip about characters having strange, sometimes nightmarish dreams, usually brought on by having eaten a Welsh rare bit. But McKay's most famous work came from what he called an idea from the rare bit fiend to please the little folk. And in 1905, he debuted a full-page, fully-colored Sunday strip about a young boy wandering through a fantastic dreamscape, which always ended with his awakening in the final panel. It was called Little Nemo in Slumberland. With Little Nemo, McKay allowed himself to experiment with the then-young medium of comics. With his inventive use of panel structure, timing, and perspective, McKay was able to create a world that truly felt dreamlike. His revolutionary composition, alongside his gorgeous trademark style that was inspired by the then-popular Art Nouveau movement, made Little Nemo an instant classic. But Windsor McKay was not one to rest on his laurels. After quitting the Herald in 1911, he moved on to bigger ambitions. Inspired by the flip books his son Robert brought home, McKay wanted to see if he could make moving pictures of his cartoons. Making 4,000 drawings on rice paper, McKay conceived an 11-minute silent short starring the characters from his comic. The film, titled simply Little Nemo, released on April 8, 1911. It was a critical hit, and a favorite among the vaudeville circuit. But the film was also plotless and experimental, acting more as a demonstration of a new art form rather than its own creation. But McKay still felt like he could perfect this new medium, and in 1914, he released his landmark film, Gertie the Dinosaur, a film about a childish dinosaur who did tricks for her master. While simplistic, it was the first film that made use of animation techniques that are now standard, such as looping, registration marks, keyframes, and in-betweening. Four years later, McKay would also pioneer the more efficient usage of animation cells in his landmark 1918 film, The Seeking of the Lucentania. While McKay was not the first man in the world to make animated cartoons, as he so liked to claim, J. Stuart Blackton and Emil Cole beat him to the punch by a couple of years, he was definitely the man who helped popularize the medium. The works of McKay directly influenced a lot of the figures that we associate with ushering in the golden age of animation. Otto Messmer, the Fleischer Brothers, Walter Lance, Chuck Jones, Paul Terry, and most importantly, Walt Disney. Disney was so inspired by Windsor McKay that when he invited his son Robert to be a consultant on a TV special devoted to McKay, Disney took him aside and said, Bob, all this should be your father's. Sadly, McKay never got to appreciate his impact on the animation medium. In 1921, he was forced to give up the endeavor at the behest of his employer, William Randolph Hearst, who wanted him to focus more on making editorial cartoons for his newspapers. In 1927, at a dinner in his honor, McKay voiced his displeasure at the state of the then-current animation industry, saying that they had turned an art into a trade. And on July 26, 1935, Windsor McKay died of a sudden cerebral embolism, just three years removed from the first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Windsor McKay's influence on both the medium of comics and animation cannot be understated. He might as well be the root from which all knowledge of modern cartoons and comics spring from. 
People in both trades know this, as there have been countless tributes to both McKay and his characters throughout the past century. Oh, oh, I had such a terrible fight! But interestingly enough, the most ambitious tribute to McKay did not come from Disney, nor Fleischer, nor any other American that was directly inspired by him. Instead, it came from a little animation studio in the country of Japan. Little Nemo, or as it's known by its full title, Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, exists as a faded memory, at least for the core millennials that saw it when they were young. I'm sure many in their late 20s to early 30s have recollections of seeing the VHS case resting amongst his animated brethren at the local Hollywood video, or even having your parents renting it on a whim and having it scare the ever-living snot out of you, like it did me. So, I'm sure that many of the few that did watch Little Nemo as kids would be surprised to know that this movie is an anime. It certainly doesn't look like one, Studio Ghibli films obviously look way more anime than this, but it counts as an anime film because it was bankrolled and produced by a Japanese company and released in Japan first before given a limited release here three years later. Not only that, but it was also one of the most ambitious projects undertaken by a Japanese studio at the time. It was a film that was years in the making. A dream project brought to life by a large budget and a veritable who's who of international talent. Tragically though, Little Nemo was a commercial failure both in its home country and in the States. That, alongside its mixed critical reception, was enough to condemn the film to a fate of just being another little animated oddity that was not Disney. Lost amongst the sea of other well-drawn yet conceptually weird animated films that, for a while, only appeared to exist as fodder for the critics of nostalgia that proliferated the internet like a bad rash in the early 2010s. Now I gotta straighten out my Little Mermaid underwear! But now that all the dust has settled, the question remains. Why did Little Nemo fail? Why did a movie that had so much passion, so much money, and so much talent behind it end up falling flat on its face? The answer is a long one. We got a lot to get through, but there's really only one place we could start. The three words that both begin and end the Little Nemo story. Tokyo Movie Shinsha, otherwise known as TMS. Being one of the oldest institutions in Japanese animation, the history of TMS is a very long and storied one that would be an entire video on its own if we did it in any detailed capacity. So we'll just focus on the history that's relevant to Little Nemo. While the company was technically established in 1946, it wasn't until 1964 that the studio as we know it today was founded by a man named Yutaka Fujioka. An artist who mostly did stop motion and puppeteering in the 50s, Fujioka founded the studio as Tokyo Movie in 1964 upon hearing that Osamu Tezuka and Tokyo Broadcasting Station needed a studio to do an adaptation of his Big X manga. Tokyo Movie, alongside their assistant studio A Productions, or A Pro for short, got steady work throughout the 60s. But it wasn't until 1969 where they had their first monster hit with Attack Number no. 1, the first televised shoujo sports anime, and the anime that's credited for bringing a more older crowd to the shoujo demographic, which at that point was mostly just children's stories. From that point onward, Tokyo Movie had a huge successful run throughout the 70s, producing some of the most memorable anime of that era, including Aim for the Ace, The Rose of Versailles, and their most popular and most long-running franchise, Lupin the Third. Midway through that hot streak, however, Fujioka decided to restructure his little company. Between 1975 and 76, Fujioka renamed Tokyo Movie into Tokyo Movie Shinsha, and replaced A-Pro with Telecom Animation Film. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, this would be Fujioka's first step into realizing his dream project. And this is where the fun begins. To really get a grasp on how much of a passion project Little Nemo was, you should look no further than the first step TMS took to making it. 
In 1977, Fujioka personally flew down to Monterey, California and convinced Windsor McKay's descendants to obtain the film rights to the comic strip in person. This was not just an attempt by a studio to obtain a familiar name brand just to slap on a movie for a quick buck. This was something Fujioka really and truly believed in. And for a project of this magnitude, he wanted the best of the best to be a part of it. In 1978, Fujioka decided to start planning for the film. The first person he approached was George Lucas, currently riding high on the runaway freight train that was Star Wars. Lucas was approached to act as a producer, but he ultimately turned the offer down, stating that he felt a character like Nemo had little room for growth. That same year, Fujioka also approached Chuck Jones to be a part of the production. Jones, not only being an accomplished animator, was also an admirer of Windsor McKay and did seem like a smart choice. However, for unknown reasons, Chuck Jones also turned down Fujioka. It wouldn't be until February of 1982 that Little Nemo would be officially announced as a project. In February of that year, the company TMS Kineto Graphics was formed in America to produce Nemo, and the studio immediately started scouting talent from around the globe for the project. Among the first people attached to it was noted film producer Gary Kurtz, who had helped produce films like the aforementioned Star Wars. Also hired was noted science fiction writer Ray Bradbury to write the scenario, and screenwriter and noted comic enthusiast Edward Summer to write the screenplay. In August, TMS flew 14 of their most talented animators out to California to meet with the production team and attend animation lectures held by Frank Thomas and Nolly Johnston, two of Disney's Nine Old Men. Some of these animators included Yasuo Otsuka, Yoshifumi Kondo, Isao Takahata, and Hayao Miyazaki. Soon after this event, however, Takahata and Miyazaki would not only leave the Little Nemo project, but TMS in general. Takahata echoed the same sentiment as Lucas before him, saying that he didn't see Nemo as a character who could grow. Miyazaki, who would famously recall his brief time on the project, the worst experience he had ever been through, was really not a fan of the concept of a story where everything takes place in a dream. He could have also been feeling creatively stifled, as the project he took immediately after Little Nemo was a film adaptation of a manga he drew that he would also direct. I wonder if that will lead anywhere. Then, on August 1984, the Nemo project hit another bump. Gary Kurtz unexpectedly dropped out as producer. But that didn't mean the project was over. Far from it, as in six months of work, animator Yoshifumi Kondo and his staff were able to complete a three and a half minute long pilot film. Shot entirely in 70mm, the 1984 film plays out like a typical Nemo comic strip, with Nemo flying across the city alongside a human companion named Icarus before crashing and ultimately ending with him having fallen out of bed. The animation of this film is jaw-dropping with how much gorgeous visuals it can fit in such a short runtime, full of stunning backdrops, amazing water animation, and beautiful flight sequences that would later serve basis for Kondo's work on Porco Rosso. This film was widely praised by the American production side, and sponsors to the film felt like this film still had a shot, even with Kurtz gone. It also didn't hurt that TMS was gaining a positive reputation in the industry, as the company American producers could outsource their TV animation to and have them turn in a quality product, especially at a time when TV animation was incredibly dismal. Then in 1985, Kondo leaves both the project and TMS after being hospitalized for pneumonia. And it's here at this point where Little Nemo enters the Troubles. Between 1985 and 1988, the production team was a constant rotating cast of writers and animators on both sides of the Pacific. Names like Chris Columbus, John Canemaker, Richard Martini, Ken Anderson, Corny Cole, Brian Fraud, Osamu Dezaki, and even French comic legend Mobius were attached to this project at some point. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson still stayed aboard as consultants alongside Warner Brothers background artist Paul Julian. Music and songs were being composed by Disney's own Sherman Brothers, this being the first and only anime film they worked on. All for segments that would have animation based on the choreography provided by Michael Jackson choreographer Michael Peters. But despite all of this, the production was not moving forward. Six years later, Little Nemo was still technically in pre-production. At one point, animators Jerry Reese and Brad Bird were briefly attached to the project, and they described the environment at the studio thusly. We were sent down because we were told the project was drifting, and were asked to check out and give our assessments. So we went down to a building they'd rent out in Hollywood to check out what was going on, and were staggered at the quality of the artwork on the walls. The key staff was half American, half Japanese, all great artists, amazing stuff. 
We were floating around, talking to people casually, asking them about what they were doing, and they said, we're just illustrating what Ray Bradbury is writing. We walked around some more among the jaw-dropping imagination and talent on display, and ran into Bradbury himself. We remarked about the terrific work and asked Bradbury about the story he was writing for the film. I'm just putting in writing what these wonderful artists are drawing, he said. Jerry and I looked at each other. Uh-oh. All the Simon resources put into this film, and the only thing they had to show for it was two more pilot films. One, a five minute one by Sadao Tsukiyoka, has been lost to the sands of time. The other, a ten minute one by Osamu Dezaki, is a lot closer to the final product. We see a lot of the basic story beats as well as a lot of the changes, such as Icarus going from a human to a flying squirrel. The difference between this and the final product is that Tazaki's film feels more like a perfect melding between McKay's art style and traditional Japanese animation, rather than the Disney-esque style they ended up going for. Confusion, creative clashes, and the lack of communication between different departments of what the story of Little Nemo was going to be is the reason why this film languished in pre-production for so long. The longer it languished, the more talent got fed up by all of this and left to work on other projects. It wasn't helped that TMS were constantly being tied up with their commitments to Deke and Disney in helping them animate their Saturday morning cartoons. It also didn't help that, at the same time, TMS was working on another big budget animated feature. While obviously having a way smoother production than Little Nemo was having, Akira was still just as ambitious of an animated film to be working on, and I'm sure it ended up taking away some of the resources that could have been used for Little Nemo. It really wasn't until January 1988 that production really began in earnest for Little Nemo. By that point, TMS had hired Disney and UPA animator William T. Hurts to direct the film on the American side, while Sanrio director Masami Hata would head up direction on the Japanese front. When Hertz and Hata were brought aboard, the Los Angeles studio walls were covered in concept art and storyboard ideas. According to Hertz, they had enough material to make a six-hour movie. So after whittling all the ideas down into a 90-minute feature, and TMS finally completing production of Akira, animation finally began in June of 1988, and was completed next year. After so many years of wallowing in the mire of unfinished concept art and pilot films, Fujioka's dream project was finally finished and ready to be premiered on July 15, 1989. But because it spent so long in pre-production alongside its normal big budget, Little Nemo cost TMS 3 billion yen to produce. That's 35 million in US dollars, which would be 73 million today. Combined with the fact that Akira did good, but not great enough to justify its 1.1 billion yen budget, Little Nemo would have to make some serious bank if it didn't want to put TMS in serious financial danger. But I'm sure with the amount of pedigree behind it, Little Nemo would definitely be the most popular anime film in July of 1989. One cannot help but feel that Miyazaki got the last laugh against his former employers. But even without Kiki's Delivery Service, aka the highest grossing Japanese film of that year, Little Nemo was still up against some serious competition in the way of a very packed summer blockbuster season. And when the film was released in America three years later, the distribution company edited it down to get a G rating and only gave it a very limited run. So Little Nemo bombed, not even reaching 1 billion yen at the box office. If it wasn't for their subsequent work on Tiny Toon Adventures, Batman the Animated Series, and Animaniacs, TMS would have gone extinct long ago. But contrary to some rumors, this film did not cause Yutaka Fujioka to retire from the business. Him being in the 1990 staff photo for Tiny Toon Adventures proves that he was still a part of TMS after Little Nemo flopped. He officially retired in 1992 and died in 1996. So really, we can probably just pin the film's failure on just poor timing. Even if Little Nemo as a franchise did have recognition in Japan, being released in a packed summer blockbuster season was not going to do it any favors. It fared just about as well as the average snowball does in the Kandigar Sanctum. But that would be ignoring the most important question. What about the movie itself? Putting aside the production difficulties, the poor timing of release, and apathetic distribution companies, would Little Nemo still be seen as an underwhelming failure without those factors?
Let me just say it up front that Little Nemo has a lot of problems. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that Little Nemo does right. And a lot of those things have to do with the animation. Oh my god, the animation of Little Nemo is so good, it makes me angry. The film languished in development hell for so long and it coming out looking this good is nothing short of a goddamn miracle. This is where a lot of the film's true passions and ambitions lie. Just a pure single-minded devotion to giving life to the dream world that Winsor McKay created and making it look like pure eye candy. For instance, there's the backgrounds. The art director for this film was none other than Nizo Yamamoto, a legendary art director responsible for some of the most stunning backgrounds in Studio Ghibli's filmography. His contributions are not wasted here. The sheer range of scenery that range from lush and beautiful, to gloomy and nightmarish, to surreal and dreamlike, are why they are such a big part of what makes the world of Little Nemo feel so immersive. That's not getting into the actual animation. It's clear from the outset that TMS brought their A-game. Just the opening alone is proof of the amount of sheer effort that was put into Little Nemo's animation. There's the way Nemo's sheets flutter in the wind. There's the shot where Nemo discovers he is flying by looking down on his reflection in a puddle. There's the little character movements where Nemo learns how to fly his bed. There's the flight sequences that almost harken back to the 1984 pilot film. There's the entire train chase sequence where you just see perfect animation of water as the train surfaces, followed by a short animation of seeing every part of Nemo's bed as it gets destroyed. The whole scene is just a microcosm for just how visually captivating Little Nemo is. That's not even getting into the other animated feat seen in this film, like the character movement to music exercise that is the etiquette song sequence, or the incredibly fluid dance off between King Morpheus and Professor Genius, or the spooky amorphous animation of the essence of the Nightmare King, or the entirety of the character animation done by the five friendly goblins who are constantly shape-shifting with one another, or their version of the signature walking bed sequence that the movie not only does justice, but even makes it look better in motion. The good animation even extends to the smaller bits of character animation. There's a lot of these moments of character movement that perfectly showcase what the character is feeling right at that moment. An example would be Nemo's coronation as Prince of Slumberland. He has just entered the room, all eyes are on him, and he just stiffly walks forward, trying to keep up appearances for everyone around him, but also struck nervous with the thought that he just screwed the pooch royally for plot reasons that we'll get into later. The train scene is also a good example of how the film handles its general direction and photography. If there's one thing aside from animation that Little Nemo is good at, it's establishing tone and shifting that tone. The entire point of Little Nemo is to reflect the idea of being in a dream world. When things are good, everything feels magical, whimsical, operating on its own set of rules, but not enough that you feel like you're in any actual danger. And just like with actual dreams, the tone can switch instantly to that of an actual nightmare, where everything is dark, intense, and appears to be tailor-made to play onto your greatest fears. I think the reason why this film scared so many of us when we were kids was because of how accurate it betrayed fear in a dream. Like a dream about your mother not listening to you as a monstrous freight train barrels to your house sounds like an actual nightmare I've had before once in my life. Really, the way Little Nemo makes use of its animation to create a film that's both equal parts beautiful as well as terrifying makes it feel like a throwback to the golden age of Disney films, particularly films like Pinocchio, which I feel like Little Nemo took a lot of inspiration from. The animation alone is the reason why I will defend this film to the grave, and Little Nemo should be thankful because aside from that, I'm willing to toss it under the bus when it comes to story problems. I've heard of Little Nemo be described as a beautiful plate with nothing on it. And I have to agree with that assessment because Little Nemo as a story just feels like an afterthought. And I know that's weird to say considering how much time was invested in trying to make this movie, but it really does feel that way. Why? Well, the answer is quite simple. And that's because... While we can't deny the influence of the original Little Nemo comic, most of its legacy lies in its visuals and how it uses panel structure to paste out those visuals to tell an entertaining story. What it is not best known for is the story itself. 
Most of the comic strips are short, self-contained vignettes of the titular Nemo being placed in a strange, fantastical predicament, which always ended with him waking up in his bed with his parents threatening to beat him because he was making too much noise, because that's what good parenting was in the Gilded Age. And while the comic did have story arcs, they were usually basic adventure stories about going to an out-of-this-world setting, like a voyage to Mars or a trip around the world, or the very first arc which was devoted to Nemo getting to Slumberland in the first place. Nothing really in the way of character, themes, or even a plot to speak of. And all of this was told in repetitive monologues with characters loudly announcing their current state of emotion, proving that McKay's gift was firmly based on visuals and not narratives. Plus, there's also the issue where there's no real suspense in the comics because we all know Nemo is going to be in his bed in the last panel anyways, so he's in no real danger to speak of because it's all just a dream. This focus on art and setting over plot and character makes weaving an epic story out of it no small feat, and it's partially the reason why a lot of people choose not to do that when adapting Little Nemo. There was a theater adaptation in 1907 that was really more of an improv vaudeville comedy, if anything. There was McKay's own animation adaptation, which was more focused on the artist making the animation rather than the animation itself. There was an opera released in the 2010s that opted to focus on a non-linear dreamlike narrative. There was even a live-action adaptation released in 1984 titled Dream One, which chose to ignore most of McKay's comic, with the only connection to it being the protagonist of the film is also named Nemo. You can see why this film took so long when you consider that not only were they trying to make the Nemo comic a high-flying fantasy adventure, but also the first to actually do that. Not only that, but they were also given the task of adapting a comic from the turn of the 20th century to modern sensibilities. Some changes to the comic definitely came easier than most, one being the complete removal of a character known simply as the Imp, an ugly caricature of an African tribesman symbolizing the colonialist attitudes that were common at the time, though he still pops up in concept art. There's also the redesigning of the character Flip from a dated Irishman stereotype to the more clownish figure we see in the movie. Does border dangerously close to something minstrelly, but still better than what Akira Toriyama was doing around that time. And we also have the deepening of the character of the Princess of Slumberland. While in the comics she was portrayed as superficial, argumentative, and not having the same level of camaraderie that the males of the comic had, here she is portrayed as a lonely, if slightly spoiled princess who really grows to enjoy Nemo's company over the course of the movie, and vice versa. And princess or not, this is no way to treat a guest. <laughs> now what? You know, you are kind of cute. Me? And you're absolutely right. I did invite you. And I didn't say formal attire. Plus, you can't deny that they did her character a huge favor by giving her, um, I don't know, a name? His daughter, Princess Camille, extend this invitation to Little Nemo to visit our slumberland and be the official playmate to Princess Camille. But as for the story itself, it's a rather basic one. Nemo gets summoned to slumberland, gets told he will be the Prince of Slumberland and all the responsibilities within, immediately cocks it up which causes King Morpheus to be taken by the Nightmare King, and he and his newfound companions must go rescue him, which they do, the end. It's also a story that's so simple that you could guess how everything is going to play out. For example, let's take a look at the scene where King Morpheus gives Nemo the key to Slumberland. With this key, you can open any door in Slumberland. There is one door you must never open. The door with this symbol on it. This you must promise. And this promise you must never break. Sir? I promise you. Yeah, he might as well just be saying, Now Homer, don't you eat this pie. We know Nemo has to at some point break his promise and open the forbidden door. Otherwise, there'd be no story. But the way the movie goes about getting to that point feels so artificial. So Nemo and Flip are on the run from the Slumberland police all of a sudden, and wow, convenient trapdoor that not only allows them to escape, but also takes them to the forbidden door that Nemo was explicitly told not to open. And what's this? Flip goes Nemo into opening the door, and Nemo almost immediately gives into peer pressure and opens the door? Well, who could have seen this coming? The whole plot feels like it's on a railroad. The actions and motivations of the characters are entirely dependent of where they are and what actions they need to take in order to move the plot forward. But really, 
it's not the plot itself that's the problem. If Nemo hadn't opened the door, then the movie would have just been him goofing off in Slumberland for 90 minutes, and stunning visuals or no, that would have gotten old after a while. Plus, there's a whole theme of Nemo needing to learn a lesson about keeping a promise that's filled with arc words and visual motifs and ultimately get dropped in the second half of the movie and just feels more like window dressing than if anything. But, I think that for every problem that the story of Little Nemo has, it can all be traced back to one character. Yippee! So, for the handful of you watching this video at home that have seen Little Nemo, can any of you describe Nemo's general character for me? I mean, he's excitable, he's easily led astray, he's very fond of happy interjections. Yippee! Wow! Wow! We hot dogs! Yippee! Wee! Okay, I'm not gonna mince words here. Our protagonist sucks, ladies and gentlemen. Plain and simple, he sucks. There's really nothing to Nemo as a character. He's a blank slate, tabula rasa, just an average kid being taken on a whirlwind trip full of magic and wonder. This is actually close to the original version of Nemo. Nemo was not so much a character, so much as he was a representation of all the children who read the comic. He was an empty vessel for boys and girls to project themselves onto and make them feel like they were the ones experiencing the dream. Hence the name Nemo, which is Latin for no one or nobody. He is completely nondescript by design. And in the interest of being faithful to the original source material, this ends up creating a problem where Nemo is a character with little to no agency. We could discuss the pros and cons of proactive characters versus reactive characters until the cows come home, but that will not change the fact that because Nemo has little character of his own, feels less like a character and more like a piece on a chessboard that needs to move to a specific place and do a specific action to make the plot move forward. Most of this film is just him being dragged from one location to the next and just going along for the ride. Like that whole trapdoor and key thing we went over a couple of pages ago is just one example of that. But as the movie goes on, the method of Nemo getting to the right place at the right time with the right materials in hand gets increasingly contrived. Scenario 1. King Morpheus just got kidnapped by the Nightmare King that Nemo released, and Flip immediately sells Nemo out. How do we get Nemo out of the situation? Answer. Have Nemo wake up in his home, only for him to realize that he is still in the dream, and then have him return to Slumberland where everyone forgives him. Scenario 2. Nemo's companions have been kidnapped by the Nightmare King, and because he is unable to remember the incantations of the King's Magic Scepter, he is unable to save them. How do we get Nemo out of the situation? Answer. Have Nemo wake up in his home again, only for him to realize he is still in the dream. Again. And have a new character literally drop in and give Nemo a letter that has the full incantation on it so he is prepared enough to face the Nightmare King. Nothing about the story occurs naturally. No amount of conflict stays in the picture for too long because the story will find a way to bend over backwards to solve the problem. Plot contrivances be damned. I'm not watching a story, I'm watching the blueprints for a story play out in real time. I can see the man behind the curtain fiddling with the knobs and pulling the levers, telling which characters go where and which plot devices get dropped where. Nemo doesn't have much in the way of a personality because why would he need one? Why would he be his own character when he can just be a blank slate the audience can project themselves onto and have the plot literally get him out of every situation and give him everything he needs to succeed and oh my god. I just realized something. Nemo is an isekai protagonist. It seems like both Lucas and Takahata were right when they turned down the little Nemo project due to lack of potential character growth. With Nemo being such a one-note character that has the entire world nudging him in the direction it wants him to go in, the whole story feels very phoned in, and that is the last thing you want to hear regarding a movie that spent so much time in pre-production, partially because of story reasons. It sucks because there's a part of me that really likes this movie. It's not even just nostalgia, it's the amount of artistry they put into this film, almost to an unnecessary degree. The animation alone is why I think Little Nemo should be remembered for being more than just a dream project that became a nightmare. Maybe if they were willing to take more chances with the source material rather than trying to be as faithful as they could within reason, 
it probably could have been the masterpiece Fujioka wanted it to be. Maybe it wouldn't have performed so badly if it did. But considering everything it had going against it, that's a pretty big maybe. It's just a shame that a lot of this creative drive went into a film that, 30 years later, only exists as a nostalgic ghost in the minds of 20-somethings and 30-somethings who watched it as kids. I guess we could give Little Nemo a second watch, if only just to see the what could have been. At the very least, it would help keep the dream alive. It's where sad hearts are mended, where happy endings begin. So welcome to slumberland, joys without numberland, come.